So questions. So if if you're um, not subject to third party unit that's going to QSA, mm -hmm. but yet you're a pretty large institution of some kind, you just don't quite meet the standard for mandatory you know, third party assessment. For the outside. So outside. Self assessment. Do you meet the guidelines for self assessment? Sure. Would you suggest having a QSA? I know, of course, you would. You'd want to let them skip. Well, I should say, would you have some where, where I'm at right now, my, my, because Amex just retweaked how they do levels, uh -huh. I'm only a level four merchant. Right. Right? Yet I paid um, the company that Michelle worked for a large chunk of money for her and someone else to come in and, and, and help us out. Would I do that every year? No. Every three or four years, maybe? Because I also have to do hit risk assessments, right. which make PCI stuff look like a walk in the dog in the park. Um, but you do want that outside view you in your car to the network, especially after you do big changes. Um, you know, I'm in the process of putting a new EHR system in, going to new data centers, um, new finance systems, uh, all new point of sale systems. So probably when I'm done with all that, I would have another QSA type firm come in and do that kind of work for me. And essentially they generate a rock, but it, it's not a rock. It's, a, it's, a, it's an audit. Yeah, yeah, I would recommend well a gap. We call it a gap assessment. Because yeah. here's the thing, even let's say you're a level two merchant, um, one, it doesn't, it, it, I would not be surprised if the, if the losses keep mounting the way they have been, if Visa finally agrees with MasterCard that level two merchants need to have a QSA. MasterCard has floated that a couple, three times. And Visa is the, is the big gorilla in, in the pen, right? Until they decide to do it all as well. But don't forget, if you get breached, even if you're a level four merchant, bang, you're now, you now have a QSA company. Right? That's one of the ways for me that I sold bringing um, Michelle in to come to this work for me, was even though we're only a level four merchant, if a bad thing were to happen, most of partnering banks and it'll say three years is what you're going to spend having an on onsite QSA. Minimum of three years. So why don't we spend the money one time, fix our stuff, and then we'll try to do this every four or five years. Um, if your boss doesn't get that risk management, risk analysis thing, yeah. Mr. Street, you have another question? Yeah. Do you see as a, a QSA, do you see yourself trying to sell yourself more as a facilitator and stuff? You know, do you see that you have to go in trying to sell your service? Because, I mean, one of the problems is like any kind of person that's coming in to tell you something that they're, you're doing wrong, it seems an enemy. It's like, do you see a lot of stuff, you know, at the very beginning, stuff, you know, where it's mainly just you trying to show yourself as, I'm here to help you by showing you these faults and stuff, you know, will make you better. It's like, how do you come up, overcome those kind of things, especially when it's PCI and more money involved. It's going to be a lot more people that are going to be very negative yes. towards you. Yes. Um, I try to set that before, before I even get on site. When, I, when as soon as they hang, before obviously I'm not doing that anymore. But they would hand me off a here's the QSA that assigns to your organization to your, you, Mr. Client, Mr. And Mrs. Client, um, and I start that relationship right away. Um, we talk about how, how, how can we make this easier for you when you when you're trying to show them that you're not there to take a stick and right. hit yeah. them over the head. <laughs> exactly. um, then then the hackles go down a little bit. They're still on the defensive. They're still a little weary. But um, I think that I have a certain personality that, no, I'm not being funny. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I've noticed, because I've seen, I've been on site with other QSAs, and they're just atrocious. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have a certain personality that I, I become friends with them, we laugh, we joke, you know, you know me. Um, and I put them at, at some sort of an ease. We still we still talk about what needs to be discussed. Right. Um, I will still dig. Um, as soon as I see a, a, a loose thread, I start pulling at it, and they realize that. Um, I also try to try to show them, and this is important, that you understand technology as well. That you're not just. I like to basically. I want to show them I'm a security professional, not right. just a QSA. So I think by doing that, it helps. The, the key thing is if you are a CISO that wants that sort of relationship. You, you have to demonstrate it as the leader. Um, and not just be able to say it one time, you have to actively enforce the relationships. Um, 
Sean was in my shop, there was one individual who just really did not want to deal with this. Um, and there was, it was Chief Patrick. Um, and there were several instances of me pulling this individual out of a meeting where there was some direct one-way flow of communication from me to them around what was expected. And eventually they were just cut out of meetings. I just don't have time for it. Right? We're not going to screw this up. We're spending too much money for it to be about egos. Okay. Wait, you Answer it this way. I think PCI brings value because it sets up, it helps define the bar that you should hit from a HIPAA security rule in a high tech perspective uh, in a prescriptive way that unless you're willing to read several thousand pages of NIST, you're not going to find. The problem with high trust is that, and this is my personal opinion on it, is It's a, it, it, it's a lot of noise that really doesn't signify much because, again, it goes to the point of trying to assume that everyone is the same. You know, I talk to my peers in the Atlanta area. Um, I talk to folks at Piedmont and Northside and Emory, and we're all not-for-profit, um, large not-for-profit healthcare providers. Atlanta's kind of where it's predominantly not-for-profit. Um, and we all see roughly the same kind of patients and have roughly the same kind of revenue. The way each of us is solving for PCI and the individual problems we have are radically different. A lot of that's determined by the EHR system you run or if you're in another industry. Whatever your key application that makes you money, right? everything rotates around that. Um, it just takes you being smart about your environment listen to what other people are doing. I don't know if any of you were in Marcus's talk about just previously. Just because someone else is doing it, you know, it, it means you should listen to them and see if it applies. It doesn't mean you should out of the box do it. I think that's the problem with high trust. They just say you should do whatever. And I do my opinion. Another question. I have a question and a comment. Yeah. Comment was about something you asked. I mean, I'm not here to talk about, I'm not representing my company today, but uh, in my practice, we have a couple of different service offerings we specifically built to develop that relationship as the QSA. Mm -hmm. You know, especially, I mean, it's really targeted for companies that are like new to the PCI program, right? Mm -hmm. But we do a, a, a readiness review, which is basically scoping and high level review. We do a gap assessment and then we do rocks. I have never done a rocket to this point, but I found that that. Um, <laughs> I found, I found that that, I, I've been involved in that process of, uh, I found that that seems to be very helpful in developing that relationship. Can I throw some water on you for a second? Please do, please do. I strongly believe that if you are going to have a readiness assessment done, do not have your QSA firm do it for you. This is one of the reasons, was there anyone from Trustway here? Yeah, I'm talking about. Um, I'm not, <laughs> hi, I guess I'm talking about Trustway. Um, I'm not fond of their business model. Sure. Right? It's really, to me, it's really inappropriate to use USA and say, you didn't go to you know, less than stellar rock, and I will sell you the consulting services to fix it. Okay? Uh, I think that if you're going to pay the money to have a readiness assessment done, is pay someone else to do the readiness assessment. Then it's not so much that the QSA is coming, QSA is coming in blind, but they're not coming in with preconceptions. Right? And you, they, they are honest to goodness, neutral, outside people. Right? And to me, that's the key business value of a QSA or an external auditor, is they don't have any skin in the game other than providing an honest assessment of what reality is right now. Because the minute you start clouding it with other lines of business or other things they can do, because I'm a paranoid SOB, I immediately start wondering if they're trying to set me up for more business development activity. Sure. So that actually that actually speaks to my, my question re regarding remediation work because we get, you know, in in the uh, gap analysis, gap assessments that I've done so far, 
it seems like at the end of every one, they're like, okay, we want you to come in and fix this. And it's kind of like, well, I mean, I can give you guidance, but I don't feel like, I feel like kind of a conflict of interest. Well, well it is, but if you look at, let's say that you weren't at QSA, sure. let's say that you were external audit doing um, FFEIC, or yeah. you would be legally prescribed from doing that. I don't see why the QSA world is different, but if you said that, also said that. I work for a firm that we did remediation. If they wanted it, we never, so I work, I work for two, two firms. One, if they asked us, yes. But we never mentioned that we did it. The other one, after the rock was done, now I have to sit down with the project manager or, or, or the sale, whatever the person's name is, and now give, you know, what other opportunities they can go in and then find. Um, so I worked for, I, I like that, and I left that with blazing speed. Um, the one, if, if you offer it and, and they just say, hey, do you happen to do that? Well, that's different because it wasn't sure, the sure. intent from the beginning versus, okay, why be that? The other question I was, so of course, we, when we're IT people, so we want to look at that from an IT standpoint. You know, if you have a fire, firewall, you have you know, digital copies of credit card information around that sort of thing. Um, but like at my institution, we moved as much of that to third party as possible. Because we want to keep out of scope because our network yep, is yep. all funky. Yep, yes, yes. So, but then, you know, so we moved it to the business crisis. I mean, so in your instance. So you, you moved your cardboard or data network? You outsourced the, the credit card operation? Processing, yeah. All right, good. The processing. That is good. Yeah, that's very so, good. So, you know, that way we don't do the processing sure. ourselves. So then the the responsibility for PCI falls almost exclusively in business, the business side. <coughs> How much of that did you see in your environment? I mean, because we've talked about the IT side, we've talked about you know, the CISO driving it. I mean, what happens when you have like the accounting or the treasury department? It's, treasury. it's still going to be IT driving it. Okay. Um, at the airline, um, it was predominantly a, a business operation thing, uh -huh. and it still fell to the IT Lines and security teams. Even when it came down to just under the counter, like in most small airports, they still have apple clusters. You had to show here the policies, the procedures, the lock boxes. That ain't IT, but it still felt wants to do it. And my, and my belief is that the most companies, that's the way it works. Because the business sees PCIs being IT compliance. Unfortunately, I found the majority of the biggest headaches were due because of the business processes that were in place, which then IT had to deal with. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people saving things to a file server, because uh, one of the biggest things I always found was a uh, CYA. Well, I make a copy just in case. Right. And then there's 10 years of receipts with full card numbers on a box. Yep. Well, I make a copy. It's not locked. CYA, and I have a blog post about it. CYA is like the death. Yeah. So business, so that's why IT kind of owns it, because at some point it's going to be some on some system, and then IT is going to have to deal with it anyway. Right. That's the other one. Who else? There was one of the, yeah. I was just going to make a comment about establishing a four with the USA. Um, you know, one thing that I felt like with our QSA that was good is, you know, we know where our holes are. We have opinions about where our weaknesses are in our network, and, uh, but we also know where we're good at things. Yes. And uh, it was nice to have the QSA acknowledge us, I guess, um, so that you could kind of see, okay, we're kind of on the same wavelength here, you know, and uh, that helps a lot. Yeah, absolutely, and one of the cool things that you, you the way you can tell on a rock if you've done a good job you know, with your QSA is that they actually point out in the reporting compliance positive things they found, right? Because they don't have to do that, right? But if they're willing to, especially if you've got, hey, I've had, I've, here's a minor finding, here's a minor finding, but here's some very good stuff we found as well. Um, it makes me look a little bit better, right? Because yeah, we had a couple findings, but hey, here's all this as well. Um, but if you get yeah, if you piss off the QSA, funny, 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 funny conclusion. <laughs> yeah, and, and as part of being negotiable uh, with the rock, you know, you may ask them, uh, can we expand on that in the executive summary section? Hey. <laughs> um, 
so that part of the report, right? So, hey, we did it. Uh, during that wrap up, I would, you know, basically lay out what went wrong. But then at the, end, at the beginning, before I kind of destroyed their world, unfortunately, um, I would literally tell them, your IT team is good at this or that. And they really, I was very impressed. And from, from other companies, they're, you know, higher up than others. So I, I like to point that out as well because usually that meeting is the CISO and his boss and that guy. So I want to, before I, uh, you know, drop the uh, drop the bomb. I want to make them feel good about it. Yes, because <laughs> I don't. Because as soon as they hear this, they're gonna look at the IT team and, and, and fire everybody. I want to make it known that these are things that are happening for whatever reason, but they're really strong in these sections. Because very few IT teams are completely incompetent. Um, pieces. There's always pieces right there, and that's the thing you make sure that you're communicating the rock and what's in the rock. Call out the tree, but also you know, that's the, the reason for the same relationship. Any other questions? Are we done? We're already just got like two minutes, a minute left. So, so there are no further questions. Um, Michelle and I will be hanging out I think, for the rest of the day. We're going to be in Raf's talk a little bit. Um, I tell I've been told, right yeah, I've been told that if I can make Raf cry, that I get bonus points today. <laughs> Raf's talk is in this room, by the way, one o'clock after lunch. Thanks a lot, y'all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Jared. <laughs> <laughs> and the lunch will actually be in the book.